Last time I filled in for Wes, it was uh, probably late August or September or so. At that time, I was talking about how we need to build our faith. We build our faith up with the word, and the more that we fill our lives with God's word, and the more we do to get God's word into our life, it builds our faith, and, it, and our faith affects our prayer life and affects every part of our life and our faith is get stronger and stronger. And part of that I took from 2 Peter in the first chapter. And Peter's telling them to start with the basis of faith. That's our foundation. I'm just going to kind of cruise through this real quick because it's kind of, kind of wordy. And Peter says, take your faith and add to it, you can have goodness, and add to it knowledge, and self control, perseverance, godliness. And where we want to end up with that is love. That's the ending point. We end up with love. We want to work from our foundation and our faith and work it up to love. And when we can love, when we have truly, when we truly have God's love in us, that's when we're allowed to forgive. That's when we're able to forgive. And we have to have God's love in us to truly be able to forgive somebody for what they've done or just any kind of transgression that they may have. And we're going to start off in Matthew, go through the parable of the unmerciful servant. It starts with Matthew 18. And this is Jesus speaking. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle his accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to be repaid the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. He patiently with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. So when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay me back what you owe me, he demanded. Then a fellow servant fell on his knees and begged him, be patient with me, and I will pay you back. A while back I checked into I had this a while back I had another sermon that all this. And I checked out the value of like talents and denarii. And as you read through this, it's a big difference. It's kind of like forgiving your mortgage as compared to, I think, where's that 20 bucks you owe me? So there's a huge difference in the amount that's being forgiven here. Continuing on 30. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and told their master everything that had happened. And when the master called the servant, wicked servant, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And in his anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. And continuing, Jesus says, This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Well, forgiving from the heart, that's, that can be an issue. That can be a problem for a lot of people. But if we're able, if we are able to forgive somebody, to truly forgive somebody, as a tremendous showing of love, as a tremendous showing of grace, that we can put that aside, whatever may have happened, we'll put that aside and forget about it, and forgive it. In Matthew 6, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive you your sins. It kind of works out to a point where you've got this or this. 
you do this, get this, you don't do this, get this. This is kind of laid out pretty, pretty plainly. In Romans 5, you see, just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. Though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us. While in this, we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Laying out the pattern that we're supposed to follow. Follow what God has done for us. Follow what Jesus has done for us. That pattern. So, we have that all set. So how do we forget? It's not always the easiest thing. It's not something that you can just always just uh, just let it roll off your back. Some things don't. Some things sink in. Some things hurt worse than others. Some things you can forget right away. Got a few things. Nothing in any particular order. It's just kind of the order that I thought of them. But the first thing we need to do, or not do rather, if we're going to be able to forgive, is to not keep a record. You don't keep track of everything that's ever been done to you. You have somebody in your life that may have wronged you. If you sit there and you hold on to that and you just won't let go of it and you just keep going on and on, it will just start to fester on you. You've got to stop bringing up. If somebody brings up a topic that has anything close to what may have happened to you in your situation, don't bring it up. Don't keep making it worse because that's just every time you think about it, you keep bringing it up. You're holding on to that record that you won't let go of. Proverbs, it says, he who covers an offense promotes love, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. So we have to find a way in ourselves. For the small stuff, things that happen to you, we just have to, some of those stuff, we just have to let it go. You know, because your Aunt Carol told you your turkey was dry back in 1984, let it go. <laughs> Bought your friend that ugly sweater and they won't wear it? Let it go. <laughs> That's not even anything worth hanging on to. But, yeah, things that are that trivial, something that are that small, people will hold on to that stuff. For years and years, people will hold on to that. Especially if it happens in, within the confines of a family. And it might be one of those family members that you only see it get togethers and holidays. And as soon as you see it, it's like, oh, there she is. And then you're, it brings it all back up again. And there it is. That's not forgiveness. Letting go of it for 364 days a year doesn't make it so when you get together on Thanksgiving, you can bring it all back up again every year. You need to let go of that. That will fester in itself, and that will infiltrate your life. And it'll become like an infected wound that will just continue to go through and through. Don't wait for that person to mess up. You ever have that one who just kind of, the one that just, you know there's this person who just waiting for you to say the wrong thing, make the wrong move just so they can spring on you. I, they just did it. There you go. See, I knew he was going to do that. He does it every year. Every time I see him, he does it. That type of stuff is what we need to forget. Let it go. You're going to hear that a lot. Let it go. But this type of attitude of holding on to little things, holding on to small stuff, that will start to affect all of your relationships. That will affect everybody that you know. Bringing it up. And if you think about it, who's the one that's the greatest for holding a record of what we've done? Keeping track of everything that we've screwed up on, every stupid thing, every dumb word we've ever said. Who keeps track of that? Satan's the one that keeps track of that. He's the one that keeps record. So when you're down and you're feeling just feeling terrible anyway, Satan's always there to give you that extra little kick in the ribs. Oh yeah, remember this? Back when you were younger, remember when you did that? Remember this? Or when you're on a high and you're feeling good about yourself, and you're feeling that Satan's also the one that's like, I remember what you were. 
I remember who you are. But I'm not that anymore. Yeah, I guess you are. Satan is the one that keeps track of all of your mess ups and all your screws. If you confess to Christ, your sins are gone. Romans 4 said, Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. When we bring it to Christ, when we can ask for forgiveness to Christ, God looks at us through Jesus. We're forgiven. Our sins are no more. There may be consequences of our sins. There's always a consequence of our sin. But when God looks at us, he doesn't look at our sin. He doesn't look at what we've done. He looks at Jesus and sees us through the blood of Christ. Satan is the one who's going to remember everything you did and try to bring it up and put it in your face so that you can't live for God. So that you're always worried about your screw-ups. Who do we rather be like? Who do we strive to be like? Like the Father who forgives and lets it go, or Satan who continues to throw it in your face. If somebody has offended you, if somebody has sinned against you, has done something to hurt you, if you can go to this person, then this is always the worst part when you hear about forgiveness. The worst part is actually having to go to the person and try to work out your problem, work out the situation. Sometimes their response may be hostile. And then you've got another one on the list. So it's like, that could like end up being a big circle that you never get out of, trying to get, get away from this uh, problem you have with this person. But then every time you talk about it, sometimes you just have to be able to, within yourself, just be done with it. We can't always be responsible. We can't be responsible when somebody else doesn't want to reconcile. But we have to be obedient unto what God wants us to do. We have to do our part anyway. Even if the person that has offended us won't reconcile, we need to do our part of it anyway. In John 20, it says, If you forgive any one of his sins, they are forgiven. And if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. We can't hold a grudge, even if we are right. Someone said one time, you can be happily married, or you can be right. You can't be both. <laughs> but is it worth being right to possibly sever a relationship of a close friend, a family member? Is it worth being right just so you can say, hey, you're wrong. I got the scripture behind it. I got everything holy standing behind me on this one. You're wrong. But is it worth it? Is it worth being that person? Luke 17. If your brother sins against, if your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times he comes back and says, I repent, forgive him. And at that point, really all it's saying is, you've got to take, when somebody comes to you, take it at face value. Whether they mean it, you know, how do you know? How do you guess somebody's heart? How do you know what they're actually you thinking? And again, on us, it's our place to be obedient. As the children of, Christ, of God and believers in Christ who are bosses, but we have to be obedient. We have to do our best to do what He's asked and what He has commanded us to do. Proverbs 17 He who loves a quarrel loves sin. I know a lot of these people. I've worked with a lot of these people. They just like to get people stirred up, get a big fight going, and they just step back and watch. You know what He said about you? Man, because they said this about you. Did you see that? And just take back and just let go. I've seen that happen. People love to just to see a fight, just to see this stuff go on. In John 14, Jesus gives us a new command Love one another as I have loved you. 
must love one another, so must you love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And this goes back again to the parable to just love and do what God has shown us as a pattern. It takes the love of God and we have to allow that to infiltrate our lives so that we can forgive. And sometimes in ourselves, we have to repent of our own sins before that we can forgive somebody else. Maybe it's something that we've done that caused their reaction. And we think, oh, well, they just, sent, they just did this to me. Well, did we do anything to them? We have to be aware of our own words, our own actions, and how we've treated other people to see how they're treating us. Maybe they're treating us like, like this, just as a retaliation, or just as a defense. In Colossians, Paul tells us, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy, dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion. He's talking this to the saints. He's telling us, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive, and here it is again, as the Lord forgave you. And all of these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. When I was reading this, um, this made me think back to, you know, we watch a lot of the, I don't even know what channel it is, it? I Survived, I think they have that, I Survived, I Shouldn't Be Alive, uh, When Squirrels Attack, and, um, and um, just all these things where everybody's dying. So I was watching this channel and they were having a marathon of serial killers going through doing documentaries each in an hour. They just run them all together. You know, at first you start off watching it and you're thinking, they should just run these people out, just string them up, shoot them down, no trials, let's just kill them, do all this kind of stuff. And then you start watching the marathon and it goes on a little bit longer and you're thinking, you know, I see where you messed up. If I was doing this, I would have done that. So now I'm thinking, you know, I've got this pretty well, I, if I wanted to be a serial killer, I think I could pull it up. So after about six hours of this, <laughs> watch out, don't be trans. <laughs> I've got stuff, I've got information up here now from all the piggies. But anyway, I was watching, and I can't remember, I was trying to figure out how I could find out which guy I was watching, but they went through the whole, you know, how what he did and all the horrific murders that he committed. And they went through the trial, they had video of the trial, they had still photos from the trial and all that. And this guy that had done all these terrible things sat, dead stare, no emotion, the entire trial. All the evidence, all the pictures, all the stuff that he had done, all out there for everybody to see. And there it is. He didn't have any emotion at all, just stared the entire time. Convicted, of course. Then at the end, before they have the official sentencing of what's going to happen. They let the families come in and give like a final statement. And when the families came in, they're you know, rightfully, they've been, had a family member horrifically taken from them. And they're just railing on this guy the whole time. Everyone that got up there, they're just ripping on him the whole time. You're horrible. You go to hell. I hope you die. I hope you die. That you were tortured like that. And they go through this one on and on, and family, family member, all these different families that finally, and this guy's just sitting there, no emotion the entire time. One elderly man gets up, at the very end, his first words, I forgive you. And you can see the change in this guy's posture. He looked at the table, looked down, first time, the entire time. And you can see the tears rolling up in his eyes. His whole life was hate, anger. One person offered him love and compassion. And it changed his whole, his whole demeanor, how he was sad, everything. One person that offered him forgiveness. And I don't know that I could even do that, but the position that all these people were in, can I say it? I forgive you to somebody that 
killed so horrifically one of my family members. That's one of those that I hope you never be able to find out. But our love cannot be a shallow love. Our love cannot be based on somebody's performance. Our love cannot be based on how people act. Oh, you're, you're fine today, tomorrow I man, I love you so much. Or, you're doing pretty good. At, you made all the cereal, didn't you? And I just, I don't like them more. And then tomorrow I do something nice for you. I know you're a great person. Did to me a hug. And, oh, and just back and forth, back and forth. That's not love. In Ephesians, it says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Just as in Christ, God forgave you. Now, if you look at this, you've got bitterness, you've got rage and anger. If you have unforgiveness in your life, in your heart, you're going to have a certain amount of bitterness towards somebody. Possibly rage and anger is going to go along with unforgiveness. Hopefully not brawling. But you're going to talk badly about that person to other people. There's going to be slander. You're going to have a certain amount, even a small amount of hate for this person. And hate and unforgiveness, if you just kind of want to blanket this all, and it's just kind of stress. It causes stress in your life. And as I was thinking about that, I just kind of like, I'm going to look up and see what stress does to your body. We'll get away from the whole spiritual part of it and just go into what does stress and unforgiveness, what does this do to your body? And I, got, I had this huge list and I just kind of broke it down. So this is the short list. The short term effect of stress. Chest pain, palpitations, cold or clammy skin, flushing of skin, breathlessness, dry mouth, difficulty swallowing, which I both have in my I don't know if I'm to Abdominal discomfort, peptic ulcers, loose stool, increased blood glucose levels, headaches, backache, neck pain, flare ups of eczema, psoriasis, arthritis, difficulty concentrating, memory disturbances, sleeplessness, anxiety, depression, and outbursts of anger, which can lead to. Chronic headaches, mood swings, anxiety disorders, memory loss, heart attack, high blood pressure, stroke, intensified allergies, allergies including asthma, irritable bowel, Crohn's disease, and sleeplessness. Just for having that little bit of stress in your life that we can't get rid of, we can't let go of the problems. Yes, it's difficult to forgive, and sometimes the only way that we're going to be able to forgive is to step back and we just got to pray and pray and pray. But we have to desire, that's the big thing with all of this stuff, we have to desire the reconciliation. We have to desire to be able to forgive and let the formula of love and faith in our God and our Savior to work in through us and to be able to do that. We love God because he loved us first, and we can love others because God's love is in us. Seek the forgiveness. It goes back, Second Peter again, have that faith. Take God's word, build on it, build on it, until you have love. C.S. Lewis says, be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. And an author, John Krakauer, when you forgive, you love. And when you love, God's light shines on you. If we are able to get to the point we we love and not be able to forgive. At what point are we more like our Savior? The gospel plan. God loved us. He forgave us. If we're able to forgive and then we're able to love, at what point are we more like our Savior? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We ask that you would just Cut into our hearts and let your word come in. Let your love fill us. And our fathers, we come to this time of communion. Help us to put aside any of the small stuff. Help us to love. Help us to forgive as you, as it says many times over, have forgiven us. <laughs>